Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the newly released Porsche 911 GT3R wheel kit from the guys at Fnatic. A very close replica of the wheel used in the actual racing car, including the new endurance button module and new Porsche wheel rim. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. I want to show you guys the wheel rim first for this 911 GT3 cup wheel. And it is an authentic replica licensed by Porsche, as you probably all well know by now. And I did get the suede version instead of the smooth leather. I prefer the suede over smooth leather, especially when I have my gloves on. It just has a better grip to it than, at least in my opinion, <laughs> it's, it's a stronger grip than the leather but the leather's great if you want to you know you have people coming over and they don't have gloves and or you don't like to wear gloves and you can your skin will grip the leather better i think than than this actual suede but i'm real happy that they didn't go with alcantara instead of the suede uh, nothing wrong with alcantara it just doesn't give me the same grip properties it, it's tight of a grip or as strong as a grip as the suede does when i'm wearing gloves and again that's personal opinion i'm sure there's somebody out there that will disagree with that but I prefer this. And you can brush these, this a suede wheel out if you just take care of it and wear gloves all the time. It should wear pretty well for you. And, then, and the suede leather never wears out anyway. It just gets matted. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't like it, fall, it falls off or something or goes away. It just gets matted and then it's, it's smooth and doesn't give you the same grip properties. And Alcatara, again, is just a little easier to take care of, but I certainly approve of their choice of suede. Now, this has a leather color dyed, uh, a leather band on it, this dyed yellow rather, and the leather one will have a red band on it, and you can buy these wheels actually individually at $150 each. So if this turns out to be what I think it is, as far as comparing one to my Momos and my OSP, OMP rather wheels, uh, yeah, then this is uh, gonna, might be a great deal just for getting a rim. <laughs> right, so again, this is a Porsche replica and I'll show you the Porsche emblem on here. And this is, again, it's very well done emblem. It's not one of those, you know, the cheapy ones you get off eBay and it has like this clear plastic over the top of it and you can't feel anything. You can actually feel all the details of that emblem. I'm trying to get a good look at it there for you. I mean, it just has a great feel to it. And of course, the look coincides with that great feel. It's a great look too. And on the back, you can see they've attached it with some tabs. And I'm sure there's some kind of a glue on here too. And you can see that's actually recessed there. So it doesn't interfere when we put our hub or whatever on the back of this wheel hub. And it's recessed into the metal there too. Again, very nicely done, very, very slick. I like the way that looks. And yeah, this has a dish on it. I'm not sure what the dish is as far as uh, degrees or whatever, but this looks like, I'd have to say it's about 15 to 20 degree dish on this. And it's not too bad. Let me show you the bottom there. It's almost even with the, the rim on the back of the rim, right? So not a flat wheel, obviously. Anything else we want to talk about? Let's talk about the grip. Uh, this is a standard type of racing wheel grip. The overall shape is a D shape because it looks kind of like a D when we turn it that way. So we get some clearance for our knees and our hands when we're spinning down. If you're in a, a proper ergonomic GT sitting position, your knees can get a little close to the wheel. So that's nice to have that flat part down there. And the grip is an elongated type of shape. What I mean by that is this way is thinner than this way, right? It's thicker. And the total diameter of this wheel is 102 millimeters. I actually measured that out too. All right. So this is a 320 wheel. That's what they're claiming it is. And I'm going to go right across the middle with my machinist ruler. And it looks like it's right at 318. So close enough to be a 320 wheel. I don't think anybody will be able to tell the difference between one millimeter on each side as far as distance. So yeah, pretty much as advertised as far as that goes. The finish is nice. It's got the brushed aluminum finish on that. Just like on the Momos and stuff. So again, just a very well executed wheel here as far as I can see. We've got the counterboard or beveled screw holes in there. And by the way, this does come with screws. We have these little flathead units. They're 13 millimeters long and a five mil or M5 thread. And that's gonna fit in here like this when we attach it to our hub. Nice and slick and professional looking. 
Yeah, I like that. That's the little things. Now, as far as weight for this wheel, it comes in at 822 grams or one pound and 13 ounces. So again, not a real heavy weight or lightweight. It's kind of in between. It just has a, like I said, it's one of those things when you pull it out of the box, it just has a good feel to it right away or straight away. Uh, again, aluminum hub in here. Should be around five mil if it's like the Momos and the usual racing wheels. So what do we got there? Yeah, there we go, five mil. Okay, don't want to scratch it up. Be careful. All right, so five mil. We know what the weight is. Anything else we want to know about this wheel? I think that's probably it. And yeah, so what we'll do is get on to uh, the next piece that we're going to be looking at. So now let's look at the Fanatic Podium Button Module Endurance. <laughs> I love these long names they come up with at Fanatic for this stuff. Right, so this is supposed to be a full-scale replica Porsche 911 or Porsche 911 GT3 Cup car wheel button plate, if you will. And of course, there's a couple little variations here. And yeah, because we're going to be using it on, you know, Playstations and Xboxes and whatever, you know, I'll, I'll be using it on a PC. But yeah. This is very lightweight. First off, it's very light. That, that's the thing that impressed me when I pick it up for a button plate because I've had you know a bunch of button plates through here at the SRG. And this one comes in at 414 grams and that's 14.6 ounces. So yeah, under a pound for sure. So very lightweight deal going on here. And I'm sure it's because of the way that the construction of it has been done. And we have a carbon plate on the front, real carbon fiber plate and on the back, we have a injection molded housing. It's got this rubberish coating on it. It feels pretty good actually. So yeah, and this is supposed to be a, not just a regular you know, plastic type injection mold. And this is actually a glass reinforced uh, material that they're using on this. And then it has that rubber coating on it. We've got the Fanatec logos on either sides. In case we forgot, this is a fan, uh, Fanatic even on the front there. <laughs> All that silk screened on. It's got this cool LED or OLED rather on the front here. And this thing is about 65 mil. They say 2.7 inches, which comes out to yeah, about 65, 66 millimeters this way. And it's about 16 millimeters tall. And this OLED is actually going to be kind of a multifunction unit. There's going to be, once the firmware gets updated and actually released, this is actually going to be a pickup telemetry in game. So some games, depending on the game, I'm sure. But we're going to be able to see some telemetry in the game on this LED, OLED. Kind of like, uh, you know, the other stuff that we use to see what's going on with our car. Uh, you know, oil pressures, RPMs, things like that, lap times, what have you. The telemetry in general. So that's going to be cool once they implement that. We've got the RPM LEDs over here on the top and flag ones on the sides, two sets of three. And these are supposed to be, they're calling these high intensity LEDs, but we'll have to wait and see once we fire it up, see you know, just how intense those LEDs are. <laughs> We've got 10 buttons and these are the flat button type of push buttons. These are, they actually feel about as good as the best ones I've ever felt of these buttons. You know, they got a good a spring pressure on it. You can brush your finger across here and not depress it, which is a good thing in case you're flying around in your cockpit trying to uh, pass somebody. And yeah, you really have to give it a, a firm push. And it does have a tactile feel to it once you depress it. How oh, well you guys can hear that. But yeah, it, you can actually feel that click. It's not just making noise. So it does have a good tactile feel, especially for this type of button. You know, I think the best tactile feeling button ever is, are the knitters, but then that's not what's in the car. So that's why we have these and yeah, they, they feel great. No, no real complaints about them. We have the menu button up here, like on most Fanatec or Fana, Fana, Fanatec or Fanatec wheels. And we've got some, we got the two-way axis that we, we you know, can roll around your axis there. So two-way analog axis switch here or stick or whatever you want to call it. Over here we have the funky switch, which is the seven position. I really like the funky switches or all, any wheel or button plate that has these seven position switches because that's seven functions that we have in one switch here, which is very cool. You know, up, down, sideways, we can turn it back and forth. And of course you can also push it. And I kind of wish they would just go ahead and put one of these over here too, because I, I don't ever seem to use this in the PC. 
for anything. I mean, you can use it for something. I just, yeah, if I, if I had another seven way funky switch over here, then that's seven more inputs, I'm just saying. So yeah, it'd be cool to see something like that on there. We have two toggle switches here, up and down. All right, and they got the nice rubber boots on them. So if you spill your beer on there, it won't go in. <laughs> we have some selector switches down here that can double as a regular rotary encoder, depending on how you have it set up in your software. And this is actually a good feeling. I have to mention, you hear that? That's a nice positive detent inside of these. Really feels good. They're not loose. They, they're, you know, they're, they're firm enough that I don't have any problem with that. But yeah, the detents are very, very nice. They're spaced well. So when you turn this, you know you've turned it, even with gloves on. So yeah, good turn there. I like that. All right, so anything else on the buttons? Not much else going on there. We'll flip around to the back, and you can actually see the carbon fiber of the front plate there in the back and all the information that Fanatic gives us for this. Now, the holes that we're going to be attaching this to our podium hub with are not just holes through the plastic. You can see these are metal inserts, and I believe these are aluminum. We'll give them the magnet test. Yeah. This must be aluminum because it's not sticking at all. If it was stainless, it would give me a little bit of, of pull, but it wouldn't stick. But yeah, these must be aluminum. So that's good. We've got metal reinforced holes here. So that's good for the strength of this button plate because now, you know, we're going to be putting this on a DD1 or DD2 and they can get some pretty good torque levels on those. So yeah, good to see that. We have a little plug coming out of the back and this is a USB-C plug. And that's actually going to be plugging in to this. I believe that's going to plug into this and then plug into the hub. It may plug directly into the hub. We'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Once I get the hub open, I'll be able to tell. So yeah, it, it must be the hub because there's no way this is going to the, the back of the any one of those Podium DD uh, wheelbases. There's no way it's going to reach. So I imagine that's what it's for. But we'll see once we get there. Right, we also get some more screws. And we got some screws with the rim that you saw earlier, if you've been following along here on the video. These are, I believe, 20 mil long. These are M5s, of course, because that's typically what we have for all of our wheel screws. I'm going to measure that out. That's about, yeah, 20. Yes, yeah, 20 mil. 20 wheel M5, and of course, it's the flathead so that it will recess into our steering wheel. You can see that the holes here don't have any bevels or counterbores to them because this is going to go flat up against the steering wheel back, right? So, got it over here. It's going to be sitting in here like this. So that's why we need the flat hitch screws. Hey, it's already looking pretty good, huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Anything else we want to talk about this? Uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. Um, we went over the weight, yeah. So yeah, that's about it for this. And again, it's it does have that plasticky feel to it on the back. Of course, there's a carbon on the front, but it's got a different kind of plasticky feel because I think it's with that rubber coating they put on this stuff just gives it an upgrade feel when you're, you're actually have it in hand. So I appreciate that they go to the extra step for that and just don't have this, you know, plastic, just regular type of injection molded plastic material that we see on so many things day to day on just about everything we use really. So yeah, that's, I like that they did that. But we're going to have to wait to about further judgment on this until we actually attach it to the wheel. And next, I think I'm just going to take a peek inside and see what it looks like. All right, now for a quick peek inside. And very, as usual with, with Fanatic, a very tidy job here, very professional looking. You can see some, some chips there and a plug in there. And everything looks to be surface mounted all the way around. So, and you know, we have the, let me go ahead and pull this out a little bit. So you can see it's kind of a module within itself there. Everything is very well done there. I like, I like the look of this, and you can see down in there. And there's our plug that I don't want to mess with. So we'll just leave it alone. And yeah, so just a quick look inside. You know we love to do that just to see how everything's done, is done rather, and the manufacturer, how they manufacture this. And yeah, looks really good. This is a, I measured this out to, or mic this out to be, I believe it's a two mil. Yep, a two mil carbon fiber plate with the decals, and yeah, everything looks as I thought it would. Very clean, tidy, and professionally done, as usual, when we look inside the Fanatic wheels. Right, so we'll get to the next segment. The Podium Hub. <laughs> now, that's a short name that I like. I've been looking at this for a long time. I've, this is the first time I actually got my hands on one, and I always like, kind of like the look of this. You know, it's got that monocube-type 
structure about it around the sides. And it's just, you know, like I said, the gold anodizing on this aluminum. Of course, this is all aluminum. It just looks nice. And I was thinking that it might be, if you look at it this way, a little bit smaller in, in general size than the universal hub. And that's over here. So there's our universal hub. And the face plate part is smaller. You can see the two comparisons there. So, yeah, not much smaller, though, is it? And if we stack them next to each other, well, this is going to show up here, but we've actually got about another 10 mil. These lugs on here are actually 10 mil higher than the flat piece over here. But remember, when you use this button plate, we're actually putting buttons on it, or rather this universal hub, not a button plate. We're putting other buttons on it, and there is an extra bit there in height from this, but not 10 mil, obviously. All right, so I just was thinking maybe it was a little shorter, but it wasn't. So just thought I'd show you guys that as a comparison. And let's see, what else can we say about this? The plastic piece comes off, and there's a circuit board, and the connectors for our, uh, the APM modules or for some buttons. So you can actually run some of these button clusters if you want to on it. I think there's a, a room for two, but we'll, we're going to go in there and look and find out. Uh, removable hub on the back here so you can take this off if they go to a different hub system or something or an upgrade or whatever the case may be you can take this off so put in put another one on whatever it is the fanatic comes up with in the future maybe and yeah not a whole lot to see here now here's something the USB-C port and if you remember when I was talking about the module we had this USB-C hanging over I wasn't sure if it was going to be long enough but if you use this with this hub obviously it's going to be long enough because we're just going to kind of stick it on there like that and the, the plug's got plenty of room to get in that port awesome all right so let's go ahead and take this thing apart now first off uh, we can talk about well while i'm talking apart it's only a uh, three two millimeter little button heads in there see those and this has an arm processor in it that is 16 bit on two analog Accesses and you can support 10 buttons and you might think well 10 buttons and two accesses that's not much <laughs> but remember we also have the data port right and that's where we, you can actually add additional buttons accesses and of course uh, whatever displays whatever fanatic may come up with in the future or maybe somebody else comes up with something that can actually work on this right so there's the piece that comes off and again you can see the little access slots in there for our wires when we actually put this together with our APM module or if we were going to be running some clusters. Now, let's go ahead and have a look at this. And there's the ARM processor right there in the middle. All right, and this little guy sitting here, service mount. And yeah, it's very clean in there. The usual fanatic cleanliness when it comes to circuit boards. Just, you know, all their stuff's very well done, as you guys may know. Now, we have a six pin interface here or header and a six pin header over here. And those are for the APM modules. So when I put those on, and that's what I'm gonna be using, then we'll be plugging them into these two plugs over here. Get my, I'm working in reverse on the camera here. This one and of course this one. Now these two down here are for these guys. They're four pin headers and that's a four pin plug on these little button clusters, right? So you can use it for that. In addition to, I don't know, you have to find a place to hang your button cluster. <laughs> so anyway, pretty simple, pretty clean in here. Um, not much else to see. Now there is this white header. You see that one there? And that's also, let's see, what's that? One, two, three. Yeah, that's a six pin header too, but it's, it's bigger pins. So I'm not sure what that's for. It might be for like firmware updates or something, or something in the future that Fnatic may be coming up with or out with rather so yeah that we can actually put it in that white plug header right there right so not much else to see here um yeah pretty simple stuff isn't it uh let's talk about the weight this is 584 grams with our plastic piece on top of it or that comes out to one pound and 4.6 ounces for all of my friends over here in north america <laughs> Other than that, yeah, it's it's pretty much like I said. I'm a little a little surprised that it's actually longer than the original U Universal Hub. Of course, they're still selling this, but you know, so I'm a little surprised by that. But it is a little more compact on the on the face design. So anyway, 
So yeah, all we have left to do now is we're going to go take a look at the APM modules and then we'll start building this thing. The Podium Advanced Paddle Module, or modules. <laughs> so I did an extensive review on these and you can go back in my video list and find that if you want to get a lot of details on this build, how they built them and how we put them on. I'm not going to do that for this build because, well, I've already done it. And, you know, they are what they are. They're very nice units, actually. I really like these things because they have very stiff, nice feeling shifter buttons here, the way this is set up. We got analog that we can use for our dual clutches or a throttle and a brake. So, yeah, very nice units. We've got the two access holes there we'll be using to mount to our podium hub. So, not much else to go into here because, again, then we'll just, this thing will drag out way too long. Now, here's the paddles. And, I still, every time I look at this, take one of these out, I go, man, that is just a nice packing job, <laughs> the way they did this. Now we're going to be using the GT paddles, and we'll also be using this one up here. It looks like a shark, not a shark fin, more like a surfboard fin, maybe? <laughs> anyway, we'll be using this and this, and on the formula wheel I used, this is a shifter, and this is the second button up here. It's got a little Z zigzag thing going on there. Almost looks like a sail. <laughs> All right. So and if you ever lose your way here, it's very simple. The box actually has the configurations for us. There's the F1 configuration where we have that smaller paddle and that sail looking thing paddle for the top. And of course, over here, we have the GT setup with the large GT paddle and that surfboard fin looking piece on the other side, on the, on the top part. So that's how we'll be doing it. Why not? That's what it looks pretty good to me anyway. So we'll take these out and get a little closer look. I still, every time I like, again, I really like these. Usually I'm like big on the gold bling stuff, but these things really look good. Once you have them in hand, I don't know how well they're showing up here on the video with these bright lights, but it looks good. And it's, of course, it's going to go well with our podium hub here too. So it's just one of those things that I've always liked. Now, not the thickest things in the world, only two milli millimeters thick. At least I think they're still two millimeters. Yeah. Whoop, where are they? Two millimeters thick. And which is fine for the small stuff, but when we get into the bigger stuff, you know, uh, I'd like to see three mil maybe, but you know, that's just me. I'm sure there's plenty of people who would disagree. Plus they cut these big holes in the top, but we have these beveled pieces here where the screws go. And again, the, the bevels here worry me just a little bit as far as longevity. Um, it's just because we're boring into something that's already kind of thin in the, you know, for our flathead screws. But I don't know. I, it's just one of those things when I look at stuff is, you know, I've been working on cars and things so long that you kind of draw decisions from when you feel something, you know, and you look at how it's built. But uh, yeah, I'm sure they'll work fine. So what we'll do next, so like I said, there's not much else to see here. And what we'll do next is go ahead and get to the actually as, actual assembly of the wheel. And yeah, that's the fun part, right? We're going to build our own racing wheel. So yeah, we'll get to that next. Now we can start our wheel assembly. And I went ahead and pre-did one of these modules. And I'm going to actually do one here with you as I'm doing it. So, so you can see how I did it. It's very simple, really. Again, we're using the big GT paddles. And we're using the smaller uh, surfboard type of fin. <laughs> or windsurfer fin, maybe. It's kind of big. Uh, on the top part. So look over there. And this one's going to go here. And we just screw them on with these provided screws. We get these little teeny guys here. And you can see the little teeny flatheads. They are two millimeter metric hex driver size. And these are M3s, I believe. Let's see, M3s or M2s? Survey says M3. Okay, so M3s. And how I usually do this is I'll put the small one on first because once the big one's in, you kind of kind of work around the big one. And what I'll usually do is just put the screw in first like that, right? So that kind of holds it there for me while well, I take my two mil driver wrench and I'll kind of just come over here and look down on top of it, put the wrench in the screw so it doesn't get out and just go ahead and get it started. And I'll go ahead and run it in so it holds a little bit. I don't want it real tight yet. I'll just snug it up a little bit so this panel doesn't move around on me. So when I get the next screw to go in, I don't have to worry about that. Remember this one, I won't be able to push through there to hold it for me. So I'm going to kind of tilt this up sideways so this won't fall off. So I'll just go in sideways like this. And there's magnets on this too, so it's dragging your wrench around a little bit. So if I'm going in sideways, it has a, it's less likely to fall off on me 
and cause me some drama, right? Easy enough. And then once I have that one in, I'll go ahead and tighten it down pretty good and go ahead and get the other one. All right. Same thing with the GT paddle. Again, we're using the small little teeny screws for this. And I'll put one in here like this. And then I'll go ahead and get it started straight down because I obviously I can hold it with my paddles. It won't go anywhere. And get that one started. And just use a little bit of snug to hold that paddle still for me. And I need one more and it's hiding. <laughs> it's hiding in that spacer. See, we got these little spacers too if you need them for to take it, you know, if you need a longer reach on it. But anyway, the screw is kind of hiding in there. Same thing, put it in there, and I'll pick this up and get it sideways so that I can just do this. Get a little closer for you here. Like that. The magnet kind of grabs a little bit, but we're good to go. Here we are. Well, not yet. It moved on me. So you want to make sure that, yeah, you don't want to, if this doesn't start easily, you want to stop what you're doing because you do not want to cross thread this stuff. Stop what you're doing, check it out, make sure that you're straight on the hole, that kind of thing. And there we go. Now we can tighten them down. And that should do it. All right. So now this will be facing towards us. And we've got our right paddle shifter. And then we've got our auxiliary button switch or whatever we want to use that for. And of course, our analog can come in. And that's really cool. See how close that is to the bottom of the paddle? You know, just a nice, I like the way they do, do these things. And like I said, it's very accurate. And the other one has the same kind of clearance. Exactly, actually. So very good machining here. Tolerances are very good on this podium stuff so far that, that I've seen. So yeah. All right now, all we got to do is stick these bad boys onto our module. And our module has the USB plug on the bottom. So we're going to want to be, this will be the top, right? Simple enough. Again, they provide us with all the screws we need. Here we have an M5. And this is a M4 hex bit on the top of this screw. And we'll be using that to attach our modules. Now, one thing about these modules, you'll see right here, we've got a little cutout right here on the module. Let's get where you can focus. There we go. So we've got a little cutout right here. This is where the cable's going to go. And the thing about this is, it's not that hard, obviously. I mean, you can get it done. But when you put the cable into the, the notch, it kind of wants to cover up from the inside here, that bottom hole. See that? So what I usually do is kind of just kind of pre-bend it a little bit with my thumb because it is wired and it is bendable and then kind of run it out there so I'll have clearance on that hole, on both holes. So it won't interfere with anything. So that's the idea anyway. The good thing is we're not having to feed this wire through anywhere. It's just going to kind of lay there because remember, we've got these slots in this cover here that, that are going to let that wire come through. So enough said. We're going to go ahead. I'm just kind of put this like this so it's sitting on top of it and then I'll go ahead and usually I'll just take a finger and drop it in there if I can get it past that there's another thing here the zip tie makes it a close call too in fact I gotta get my finger in there and push that down a little bit before I even go in there see what I'm talking about so when you're pushing it in there it's catching on this cable here and there's the zip ties right there right so these zip <laughs> the zip ties are holding the cable to this metal part are kind of interfering with the direct shot on the bolt too. So you just kind of have to wiggle it around a little bit to get that screw in there like that. Now, once you're there, you're home free, right? And I'll go ahead and put the other one in also. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and attempt to attach it by putting it straight down on top of our hub here. Easy enough. And I do have an M4 driver for this. And again, I kind of preload it before I start and kind of watch it as I'm going down just to get them started. And then I'll come over here and get this one started. And again, I'm going to push this down here so I can get my wrench in there on it. A little fiddly. But obviously, it, we'll, we'll get it done. There it is. There we go. And you want to make sure you get these good and tight. You know when I'm coming off in the middle of a race when you're trying to pass somebody. <laughs> so I'll just go ahead and give it a good. And I might come back with my four mil regular type of Allen wrench, the, the bent one, and snug that down one more time before I, I hit everything or I'm done with everything. So 
that one's done. Now the problem is I can't just, it's not easy to do this one on this side because, well, my stuff's in the way, right? But we'll still get it done. And the same thing applies here. I'm going to go ahead and push down on my wires here and try to get my bolt started, get my wrench from running away from me. And yeah, let's see if we can get that to go through. There we go. Cool. And we'll get the other one in there. And I'm going to kind of just, I don't know how I'm going to show you guys this. I'm, you can rest this lightly on this paddle. I'm not putting any pressure on it really. And just kind of line up my screws and then get my wrench again. And I'll usually start this screw first because it doesn't have the cable interference thing going on. Just so I can get it started and it's stable. Then I can come in and get this one like that. Kind of push against it like that and it'll push against the cable and it'll give me some access. I want to make sure it goes in easy. You don't want to strip these puppies out. Again, I always say that because, well, if you've ever done that, <laughs> then you'll know that the drama and trouble you have to go through to fix it again. I don't know. I think that's pretty tight, man. I don't think I'm going to need to get another wrench on this. <sighs> I don't see that coming loose. There we go. Piece of cake, right? All right, we're almost there. We got our shifters, and we're not going to put any of well, those button clusters on there. So now it's just a matter of getting this stuff hooked in right, right? So we've got this six pin Molex plug right here. And obviously we've got these six pin headers here and here. And the modules go in each. So this will be the right one. This will be the left one. And I'm not, yeah, I'm not even certain if it makes a difference, but that's where I'm going. That's the way I'm going with it. Just to make sure I don't, you know, give myself more pro problems that I don't need to have. So easy enough to plug these in. You want to make sure you get in the right direction. And in this case, the, let's see, where there's pins at towards that way. The pins are more that way on the connector than they are this way. So I'm looking at the connector now and see that, okay, I need, these pins are kind of the same way here. Oh, well, that's showing up. But they're more one way than the other as far as the plug is concerned. So I'll just flip that around and make sure I engage that header properly. And just kind of wiggle it down. Use your finger now or something to press it all the way down. You want to make sure you get them seated properly. You don't want them coming out accidentally somewhere. So now we get to put this cover back on, right? Easy enough to put the cover on, but there is a cable management concern here, and I am going to... How am I going to do this? I'd like to do it like this and keep... See how I, I've got some cable in here? But there's nothing to hold that in there, so it may... I'm just going to kind of tuck it around that bolt. See how that is? And this is kind of stiff here. They've got double shrink wrap on this, I think, because it's very stiff. This section of it, this is a lot uh, more flexible here. So if I tuck that down in there like that and it's riding against the back of that bolt head, the bolt head should not be too abrasive. It's pretty smooth. Uh, it's got some te uh, some grooves on it, but it's, they're smooth grooves. It's not like it's a piece of sheet metal in a car or something. You wouldn't want to leave it against that. But yeah, I think I'm going to try to leave that like that and just kind of bring my other cable in and just let it sit right there like that. And I'll try to do the same thing on this one. Just kind of push it down. Let's see if I can get that to work. Like this. There we go. Fold it a little bit and then kind of push it back under that bolt. See how I'm doing that? Again, this may pop out, but I'm just trying to get the least amount of this in here that I, I need to have. So I'm going to go ahead and just roll that in like that. This one's already rolled in. And now comes the tricky part. <laughs> that wasn't tricky. And that's getting the, this back on and getting the cables through these slots like we have to. Not that big of a deal. I can already see. You, you've got two to choose from actually here. You can use either one of these. There's no set rule here. So one may go on in a better way than the other, but I'm just going to kind of see how this is all lining up. Like that. There we go. Ah, there. Perfect. And make sure all your holes are lined up before you put that on. But we know this is the top, and the Fanatic F is usually straight up and down to the top. So there you go. Now it's a, just a matter of putting these guys back in. Remember, we took these out to look at the inside of the hub in this review. And yeah, these are two mils. Let me get my little two mil putty wrench out and get those started. And I usually go reverse twist to get these started because they're plastic screws. And when you reverse first, it kind of falls into its, the previous grooves that were in that plastic. If you just do it forward all the time, sometimes, you know, it gets a little 
off square and you'll start cutting new threads in the plastic, which is okay, it'll still work maybe once or twice, but you keep doing it pretty much, pretty soon that plastic is just gonna be worn out and it won't grip anymore. So just a little thing that I do, again, I just kind of go backwards and I can feel it drop into those threads and then yeah, off it goes. So I try to maintain the same threads every time. We got one more screw to go in, there it is. Hey, I didn't lose any screws yet. <laughs> probably, I probably shouldn't say that right now. So again, I just, there it is. You feel that little click when it lines up with the threads properly. There we go. And we'll just snug everything up because we won't be able to get to these screws after we get the wheel and this module back on. All right. Pretty clean package, huh? Yeah. This is going to be sweet. See, my cable's already popped out though. <laughs> well, I can, I kind of, I kind of knew that was going to happen. Um, so yeah, it might happen again. I might figure out something. I might put it like a zip tie. I could get a zip tie around here and down inside of there and maybe just cable manage that a bit. That's probably what I'll end up doing. All right. So now for the fun part. Now there, remember we got the longer screws came with this module here. All right. And these, these screws are long enough to go through the wheel. All right. This is a five millimeter plate in the wheel, although it's not really five mil because we've got these countersunk holes in there. So when this goes through, it's going to be not like we just had a bolt sitting on top of this plate here and it's, and it's a total of five millimeters to get through. So yeah, we're going to have that much sticking out, which should be, of course, this is the fanatic stuff. So this is, should all line up and this will be fine. But if you put your own screws in, you want to make sure that or if you've got your own wheel going on into this, this hub here, you want to make sure you don't go too deep. And the good way to find out how deep you can go is obviously you want to compensate for the wheel flange, right? Or anything else that's, in, that's going to be connected before you go into these holes in this hub. And the way I do that is just use my calipers here. And they have a little thing on the end that you can stick in a hole and then push down and it will show you how deep that is. Now this is 70 mil. That's the holes we're going for, the 70 mil PD, uh, PCD or PDC. <laughs> so I just go like this, stick it in the hole, and then I'll just keep pushing this until well, I get it to go here. There we go. Pushing the outside of it like that. And let's see if you guys can see it. There we go. 14.6 millimeters deep. So I pull it out gently. Oh, it's sticking, so... I'm gonna have to hold both pieces as I pull it out and that way it won't move. It won't move very much. There you go, 14.7. So it did move a little bit, a tenth. But yeah, 14.6 and that's how deep it is. Great tool to have, by the way, if you guys don't have these. You know, you can buy them cheap. They sell them for like 20, 30 bucks or you can buy the expensive ones like this. <laughs> but I use mine a lot and I like it to be accurate. So enough of that. We know how deep we gotta go and then you can do the math depending on what you're connecting to your hub. So. Make sure you pay attention to that. You don't want to get to a point where that's all messed up. All right, so now we're gonna set the hub, or rather the module here on top of that. And remember, we've got the USB-C that's going to be plugging in right there. And we wanna make sure that's clear when we're actually sitting this down on top of here. And there's really, let me turn this around, show you guys. Really no guide here, it just kind of fits right on the top. Let's see how close. It's just fitting right on top of there. And we're going to line, obviously, our holes here with these reinforced holes that are in the module. So I'm just going to kind of set it there and just leave it straight up and down. And I can actually look down and see those holes. Like so. There we go. So now I've got to get my steering wheel, or the rim, on top of that. So now I'm looking down again on the holes and trying to keep things lined up the best I can. And then I'll go ahead and start putting in these screws. And I got a whole bag of them here, so make sure I get them all out. Screws everywhere. All right. And I'll go ahead, usually I'll just kind of jiggle things around a little bit as I'm turning it. And you want to hand start these. You don't want to, you know, be very gentle with it. You don't want to cross thread anything, especially at this point, we've almost got the thing built, right? <laughs> How tragic would that be if we messed it up? So I'm just going to drop the rest of these in. And again, let gravity be our friend here, right? Get it started with my fingers. That feels good. It all feels good. This is 
you know, and I like this. This is this is very precise. Everything's machined very well here. There's no hiccups. There's no hangups. And as somebody who works on this stuff all the time, I really appreciate that. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it here as I tighten them down. So I'm just going to run them down first and get them in the counter bores so that they kind of self-align the wheel onto the hub here before I start tightening everything down. But just kind of get them into those bevels. Pretty simple. Again, if I can do it, anybody can do this stuff, right? And I just saw it shift over a little bit as that lined it up. So that's why you do that and not get it real tight yet. So we're just going to get everything lined up. Just like that. Now the last one's in. I'm going to start torquing down on a little bit. You're not going to need a, a ton of pressure on this, okay? They don't give a torque specification on these screws, but you don't need a lot. Um, you got six of them, right? So, yeah, you want to be tight, but you don't want to be so tight that it hurts it. And I usually go in a cross pattern. I just tighten this guy down right here. So I'll go over here to the next one and go ahead and hit that one and snug it down. Again, not too tight. And just go ahead and work my way around. Keep crossing over to the next one like that. Just kind of like putting a, a wheel on on a car, right? And that just evens out the, the torque pressures. This one's still sticking up, so I'm just going to run it down a little. There we go. Now I'll get this one for the tightening. Now I'll go over here to this guy. Tighten that one down. Nice. One more. There we go. Beauty. All right. So yeah. Wow. It's done. <laughs> Now, let me see how the reach is on this. Not bad, not bad. I'm not going to have any problem with the reach on this. And if I did have a problem with the reach, remember, we have these spacers here that come in your kit. Right, it comes with the APM Advanced Paddle Module Kit. So these spacers, I could put them in there, and they give us a longer screw. Oop, there you go. A longer screw here that compensates for that spacer, so we can still bring this paddle in if we want to. But I don't think I'm going to have to. Now, I can still get on my fingers on there fine. Plus, I'll have gloves on. So, yeah. It's just... These, these back ones right here might be something... Hmm. I don't know. The back ones are just a, kind of funky. I guess you get used to reaching around and getting to that. But, yeah, I might actually go ahead... I mean, again, this is something, once I have it mounted, this is where we're going to make decisions like that because I really don't know what it's going to feel like. Now, another thing... These cables are, remember the cables and how, how I tucked them in behind here on the modules? Oops, there you go. They're tucked in back there. Well, I think I'm going to leave them alone because I really don't see, they, they have nowhere to go if you, if you look at it because this is kind of sitting cl very close to this back of this module. And I don't see them ca the cables coming out and causing any issues really. But yeah, I might space this shifter out just so I can get around to that. But chances are, I won't be using the switch anyway, if you're quite honest. I never use it on my formula wheel, but it's nice to have an extra switch there if you need it, I guess. All right, so there it is. And this actually feels pretty substantial. Um, I am going to go ahead and use my scale. And let's see how much this puppy weighs. All together, completely assembled. Yeah, I'm curious. So let's go ahead and set this on here. And I've got four pounds and 13 ounces, or for everybody everybody else in the world, don't put my hand on it, we've got 2.180 kilos. All right, so it is substantial wheel when you have it in your hands, and most of the weight is back here because we know that the rim, if you watch that part of this little review I'm doing on this wheel, then you'll know that, yeah, it's very light comparatively. It's, it feels, again, like the Momos and stuff. This feels like a great wheel. This is going to be fine. This is really... Fanatic's done a good job here. Now, one last thing. Oh, yeah. Now, don't, if I hook my wheel up and, and it wasn't working, the module wasn't working on the front, then, yeah, I would, I would be going, wait, what happened? So what I'm going to do is plug in the USB-C. And there we go. Like that. So now our USB-C is plugged in. Modules are plugged in. We are ready to rumble. This is a bit of a reach to get through those back buttons if you need to use them for one. But, you know, it's just like anything else. You get used to it if you need it. You can just reach around and grab it. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a problem. All right. Beautiful wheel. I really like this. And I'll show you another picture again of the 
ones that were in the real race cars or still are depending on you know the year of the race car that uh yeah very close to what this is now there are they do have a button here and a button here on those wheels but yeah like i said it's very close and, and for something that's a replica pretty darn good looking wheel and it's a great feeling wheel too yeah i'm this is exceeding my expectations actually uh, fanatic's done a good job here i think they realize that this is their flagship stuff and yeah if it's going to be that and you're going to put your name on it then you're going to make sure that it all works well and just goes together well the buttons hmm i'm driving buttons a little bit reach on the top ones there a little bit of a reach for me but you know i got a small hand so it's not going to be the same case for everyone bottom ones not so much they're okay bottom ones are fine okay so there it is our podium wheel and yeah what do you guys think i think this looks pretty good and even from the back with the gold accents going on down there. Yeah, that's a good looking wheel. Now, price, $650 for this. I think it is, they're $680, $679. Anyway, it's, it's not cheap. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you got a wheel, a custom wheel built for you, or you got like a Momo and you got one of those nice uh, uh, button plates that you can buy, the nice carbon fiber aluminum ones that are third-party sellers in the aftermarket sell those things. If you got one of those and a Momo wheel or something and it had clutches or even without clutches, you're going to be pretty close to the same thing. I mean, you know, in fact, you can go way above this <laughs> depending on the wheel that you buy. So yeah, I'm, I'm like I said, uh, I, I like this. I think... And I, I don't want to say for sure, but, you know, we haven't driven it yet. But I think that it's, you know, for the price point, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to say right now that, yeah, it's not a bad deal. Here we are in iRacing at the ring, and we are in the Ferrari 488 GT3. Yes, I know it's not the Porsche, and I did drive the Porsche a little bit with the wheel. But, you know, the Ferrari is my favorite wheel, or favorite car, rather. Uh, anyway, so I usually spend more hours than that. And anyway... Uh, you know, the rim on this wheel is very close to my Momo Mod 88, maybe just a hair thinner in the grip area, but the, the shape of the grip is identical, and it's very close to the stiffness of the Mod uh, 88 that I have also, which is a surprise to me, especially at the price point. And you know what these Momos cost. I think the one this one that I bought was like $219 or something. So at the price point, if you just need a rim for your sim racing duties, this could be a viable option for you if you want to look at it. And, yeah, again, it's, it's a lot cheaper than a Momo would be, and it seems to perform pretty well. Now, there might be just a little bit more stiffness in the, the Momo, but, you know, for doing sim racing, I really don't think it's going to matter that much. Um, again, I can make that Momo flex if I want to, just like I can this one, just about any wheel, really. So, yeah, I just think it's a viable option for that. I like the suede leather, the way it's laid up here. And of course, I prefer suede anyway because I race with gloves and it's easier to grip the wheel than the smooth leather. Now, if you don't use gloves or you have a lot of people using your wheel, I would go with the smooth leather. Now, the buttons and the shifters on the module here, the APM, uh, you know, everything works just well. I mean, nothing had any issues, no dramas here. Everything just did what it was supposed to. The buttons had a pretty good feel to them as far as the tactile. When you press one, you knew you pressed it. The rotaries have a good detent and spring tension in those detents. So yeah, that they felt great too. Um, the display actually worked uh, in this shooting because I had the new firmware, the 602 I believe it is, or 620 maybe. Anyway, I had the, the latest firmware and yeah, it, uh, the, the display is working on one display. And of course, I'm now we're over at the Sebring in the Lotus 79. And again, you can drive the Lotus 79 with a round wheel. In fact, the 79 did have a round wheel in it. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of messing around with it here. But yeah, the display does give you one telemetry screen at this point. And I'm sure they'll be adding more as they go along with the next firmware update. But at least we have one that's actually working now. Because when it first came out, it didn't have any uh, telemetry working. So now we do have some telemetry, which is a good thing. And it's a basic one. It's the speedometer. Uh, it's got the speed on it. Uh, it's got gears, it's got lap time, and it's got your position. But we'll have more telemetry, obviously, hopefully soon in the future with the next firmware update. And the LEDs are nice and bright. They work well. Of course, if you're a VR driver, none of this matters to you. <laughs> so, And the flag lights work well, too. Again, it's just everything just works. It's a typical Fanatic 
stuff that I get, uh, usually it just all works. And I really don't have much I can say bad about this wheel, except maybe the, the current failures to have all the telemetry available on the display. And the display is very nice once you have it working. It's nice and bright, easy to see everything, and nice to be able to look down at your wheel and see your position and things like that without having to look up at my fourth monitor or over to the black box that's in the car itself. It's just one of those things that's nice to have. So yeah, not much else to say here as far as the, a, a steering wheel goes, so we'll just get on to the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the Porsche 911 GT3R steering wheel from the guys of Fanatic. Now, here we have four different components coming together to create a very close replica of the wheel used in the real race car. The new rim is available in either smooth leather or, what I like, the suede leather. Now, when comparing it to my Momo Mod 88 wheel, it feels very much the same. Sturdy build, a well-applied leather wrap, and a nice brush finish on the aluminum. Even the grip shape is very close to each other. This makes me think that buying the rim alone might be a good choice if you're looking for a real racing wheel for your sim racing duties. The Podium Hub is a nice addition from Fnatic. Its footprint is just a bit less than that of Fnatic's Universal Hub, but still, it is a bit taller. Of course, this hub is made to accept the very good APM units that I've reviewed earlier, maybe a few months back and can also accept Fnatic's button pods. The QR assembly is replaceable, so this hub will be ready for any future mounting solutions that Fnatic might come out with. Attaching the paddle modules to the hub was pretty easy to do with minimal dramas. Fnatic's new button module also comes with this kit, being made from carbon fiber and Fnatic's own injection molded glass fiber reinforced plastic. In hand, it feels light, yet still stiff. It has plenty of buttons and rotaries to meet most drivers' inputs needs. It has nice bright LEDs for the rev indicator and flag functions. The 2.7-inch display is also bright and easy to read. Although it is limited to only one telemetry screen as of this review, it should be adding more with the next firmware update. Now, the screen that is available now does do a pretty good job of providing the telemetry it is designed for. So much so that I'm really looking forward to getting more of these screens in the future. Using the wheel pretty much, well, it's a treat. <laughs> it's just as good as my Momo in use, and I think a wheel like this covers a lot of different cars when driving. And trucks too, if you like. Not something I would want to use for formula cars, but that doesn't mean that you can't. The APM unit provides nice crisp shifts. At the same time, they are very quiet due to the rubber stops used on this unit. Never had a problem with the shifters or the clutches. All the buttons on the endurance module worked as designed. They have a decent feel to them and good tactile feedback for buttons of this type. The rotaries also worked well with their nicely spaced detents and the spring tension on them. It's hard to find really <laughs> much for me to complain about here. Maybe the lack of the fully functional display for telemetry monitoring, but I'm sure that will get sorted in the not too distant future by the guys at Fnatic. Now, the way the Fnatic packages this wheel with four different components that can be used on other wheels, I think is a good thing. Gives you future options for moving forward for other wheels that you might want to use from Fnatic or other wheels that aren't from Fnatic. You can tell this is a podium level replica wheel setup from the build quality and the component selection. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.